Welcome to the Last Mile Podcast, where we talk about the new technologies being used by the government to enable communications and connectivity on the grid. I'm your host for today's podcast and a frequent contributor to the Last Mile Online publication, Brian Trade. Thank you for joining me. At this point, we're all invariably tired of hearing about the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Unfortunately, there really isn't anywhere we can go to escape it. Even the most traditional form of escapism, our television sets, are filled with coronavirus messages. And I'm not even talking about the news. I'm talking about every TV commercial that begins with the words, these are frightening or confusing or unprecedented times. But I certainly don't want to make it seem like the coronavirus isn't serious. It's quite literally deathly serious. As of the time of this recording, it's killed approximately 120,000 Americans and sickened more than 2 million. Our guests today are more than familiar with those numbers. They're emergency responders that have been on the front lines of this pandemic. They also work at Source One MRO, a company that provides essential supplies and provisions to government organizations and agencies that are working 24-7 to battle back against COVID-19. They are Brad Byan and Keith Cowell. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time out of your crazy schedules, especially right now, to talk with me. Not a problem. Thanks for having us. Very welcome. Thank you. So before we start talking COVID, can you tell our listeners a bit more about Source One MRO? How did it get started and what was the inspiration for its rather unique name? Uh, well, <clears throat> Source One MRO has been around for, for 12 years. Um, and they've been distributing products to the military. They mainly had GSA schedules. And uh, two years ago, we expanded the business. And I approached the owner and uh, said we, we had an opportunity to provide for first responders uh, directly to um, municipal um, fire departments uh, for a, one specific product. And then we've just kind of expanded upon it from there. And in the last um, couple of years or six months, well, we've just seemed to be able to make a lot, of, a lot more connections, uh, making headway in the fire service. And now we, we represent... Um, 16 different product lines. Yeah, and add, add on that, both both Keith and, Keith and I are uh, full-time firefighters, so we have a unique position to be able to kind of reach out to our peers in public safety in the front lines, understand their issues, and, you know, like it says in the, in the name Source One, you know, we're one source for products that a lot of these responders need in, in different situations that we can address and adhere to and understand the language and, and needs of those customers. Excellent. So, you know, we've chatted in advance of this conversation, and the two of you come across as extremely passionate uh, about the work that you're doing, you know, on, on behalf of Source One MRO. Why is that? Is that because of your time as a firefighter? Uh, both of you, your your work as firefighters, or, or for another reason? Yeah, definitely. I think being in the fire service on the front lines of some of the issues, you know, we tackle everything from now cancer is the number one uh, killer of firefighters. So we have uh, technology and product lines to help mitigate hygiene and reduce toxic exposure. Um, anywhere from that to what we're doing now with Gotenna and the communications and how it can benefit the operations um, in different situations. You know, seeing, seeing different things from different angles and being actual use, using these technologies and products, uh, definitely become passionate about it helping out the fire service and public safety. Yeah, I'd, um, I'd second that. I, uh, personally, I like to represent good products and I like to take care of our customers. And that's my number one, one focus. And it gives us a unique perspective, um, being users of the products that we sell, um, in a, in, in an emergency environment, because we've, we've been in the trenches, um, doing it. And so we, we want to represent, uh, good, useful products that will help firefighters and uh, first responders going forward in the future. So pre-coronavirus days, which it's only been going on for what, about five, 10 years now. Uh, prior to that, uh, where did you guys get most of your demand from? What were daily operations like? A lot of it for us, like Keith, Keith alluded to, um, you know, the business before us was kind of a super hardware store. Uh, when Keith and I came on, being in the fire service and public safety, understanding, addressing the needs, we kind of found the niche for certain areas that uh, the fire service 
and public safety needs operations, a lot of it. We Over the last two years, we've been going around the country talking to some of the top fire agencies and educating on cancer prevention, how we can help mitigate that and build in processes and give them products with an advanced technology. Uh, one thing you'll see of products that we carry that he said, stuff that we're passionate about, we want to try and find and source kind of these these products uh, with advanced technologies that a lot of uh, agencies and people don't know that are out there that we can help bring to the market and educate them on and have a useful application to it. So obviously the, the world's changed a lot over the course of the last couple of months. I was just joking that it's been five, 10 years since coronavirus, but it's only really been since December or January. <laughs> yeah. You know, since that time, um, you know, obviously a lot's changed. I would assume a lot has changed in your business as well. So how has the increased demand following the COVID-19 outbreak and the start of this pandemic really impacted your operations, the operation at your distribution centers, and the way you guys do business? A lot of, I mean, the core of our business and what we do is the relationships with our customers and building that trust with them. Um, obviously, the Product demand when COVID first hit, and yes, it does seem like 10 years ago, uh, but we're still kind of seeing this new wave of cases come through, and it's going to change, you know, policies and operations. We've already seen it happen, but obviously the product demand and what they were looking for and getting, you know, new policies, protocols, procedures out, and then the products to facilitate that, we've definitely ramped up our learning curve on uh, disinfectants and hand sanitizers, and we've been fortunate enough to provide um, quality EPA list in um, disinfectants, uh, different types of hand sanitizers. There's, you know, any a lot of things we do come from an educational standpoint. But we actually ramped up really quick, and we're able to um, have direct relationships with manufacturers uh, here in the U.S. You know, one of our major ones is in New Jersey. We have other ones out in Florida. Um, and just bringing on n new products that we feel are, are good for the fire service and first responders and public safety. Excellent. You, you mentioned your customers. And I, and I like to think that with you guys supplying these products to a lot of different government organizations, government agencies, first responders, that you probably have a very, uh, very interesting inside look at what the response has been like for this. And what other urgent needs were there aside from gloves? What kind of products and services uh, did you guys see a, a lot of demand and need for? How are they being used? Uh, any kind of scenarios or examples that you can give us? I'm sure our listeners would be really interested. Uh, hand, hand sanitizers, gallons and gallons of hand sanitizer, and uh, any any disinfectant they could get their hands on. Um, but they they couldn't find anything. But those are those are probably the biggest. I know they were looking for masks and um, face shields as well. Um, some of the products we were able to supply to them, and others we we couldn't uh, just because of the the supply was so the supply chain was just broken. Yeah, I mean, to give you an idea of the quantity that we were providing, we were doing anywhere from five gallon buckets of disinfectant to 375 gallon totes that they were kind of central locating in a strategic area and allocating it to different municipalities and fire departments within that area off a huge 375 gallon tote of disinfectant to help share it throughout, throughout the area and need but those were seem to be the first two things that were were critical as well to build in you know those safety precautions and disinfect and clean uh, as they're going out to these calls and potential exposure to covid patients and i think new jersey was hit hard not necessarily because they weren't prepared i mean we're all you know all hazard incident management type agencies it's just they and if you see it in the news now they're still getting hit with a kind of a cluster effect of increased cases there for whatever reason so that seems to be what they're dealing with and, and trying to manage as far as a case count i mean the fire service is pretty innovative we we saw some of the agencies kind of modifying our scba packs into sprayers and putting um air airless or sprayers in service with the SCBA bottles. Uh, we saw paint sprayers being used, typical, you know, the, the homeowner type Hudson manual pump sprayers. Uh, since then, uh, there's been a lot come 
in the way of technology, we actually just became reps for Graco Sandy Sprayers. So they saw a need to upgrade the components because some of the ingredients and disinfectants can corrode the aluminum and break just regular off the shelf airless sprayers. So they actually have developed uh, an upgraded component sprayer that we're um, helping distribute to these areas. And that just came online. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, you know, police cars were going through lines like a car wash to get infect or uh, sprayed after possible exposures or on a weekly basis. So there's been different policies implemented, different use cases, different frequencies. Um, we've, we've kind of seen it all. Uh, LA City, uh, one of my friends is on the logistics team there. So they're setting up the convention center as a kind of a remote uh, triage area for COVID testing and whatever it may be. So they were in the process of setting that up out here on the West Coast in LA. So you, you, you've seen it all from small volunteer departments needing supplies to big departments like Chicago, uh, LA City, FDNY, Jersey City. You know, there, there's a lot of people that sell stuff to the government. You know, there, there's a lot of folks who, you know, make things and distribute things to the government. But you, you guys are in a little bit different of a position because you're full-time firefighters and paramedics and you're, you're boots on the ground, too. So, you know, how does that work? The work that you guys do on the front lines, how's that impacted your ability to support your customers? How's that impacted the work that you're doing with Source One? I think on all fronts, it's just given us a, you know, that extra knowledge and inside look to, Hey, these are products that we either need and use, or we see an opportunity to advance some of our operations with the advanced technology. Um, if it anywhere from, you know, we just are distributing Bole safety and they have advanced technology on their platinum lens, which is anti-fog, anti-scratch. Uh, they're implementing that into the face shields that they're developing and, and so they have about two and a half million face shields that they've been manufacturing that have this advanced technology as to where they anti-fog and just understanding from us going on calls, wearing these masks and some of the safety glasses and goggles that we're using and they fog up. Well, that doesn't really help you if you can't see, you know, whether it be cutting up a car and extrication, or if it's helping a patient uh, get to a gurney, if you're all fogged up, you know, you can't do your work. So just the, you know, seems simple, but technology that's an anti-fog plus anti-scratch because of all the stuff we do, knowing that that's a critical piece and us being able to facilitate that and understand that and articulate that to our customers and the chiefs and um, a staff that's purchasing these uh, and show that advantage of, of why they're purchasing it and how it can help them. I think just that inside knowledge for us really helps. The same with, you know, when we talk about GoTenna and technology and a communication uh, I work as a public information officer. So in California, we have six IMT teams that are built up through personnel throughout California that come together and manage these large incidents and seeing how communications is distributed on these massive, large scale incidents, knowing that what we do there and knowing the technology that GoTenna provides, we can help articulate that conversation and say, hey, this is what you do operationally. This is how this technology can help us operations, which always, you know, helps with efficiency and cost and um, of that nature. What would you guys say, you know, as people who are there working on the front lines, what, what kind of connectivity challenges, what kind of communications challenges have you seen arising um, due to this COVID-19 pandemic? I think a lot of it is just, and we don't deal with a lot because we're a very urban area. We're kind of San Diego County. So just to give you an overview of how we operate and what we're used to, we deal with both 800 megahertz and VHF because we are tied into a mutual aid system with um, CAL FIRE, which is the state agency for California. And they primarily run on a uh, VHF in their rural areas. Some of their mun mun municipality uh, contracts that they run have 800 service. So we, we run a dual function and have antennas throughout San Diego on the trunking. But if you look at some of the uh, rural areas and, um, places that don't have that luxury and infrastructure. Uh, the Gotenna is a, is a perfect use case scenario application wise to be able to distribute communications and have a low cost um, 
high operational output of antennas and communication systems. And then internally, even with our infrastructure, if you have kind of this uh, condensed operational area for search and rescue, being able to communicate internally with your team members in that closed ad hoc network is, is very beneficial along and build that in with, you know, the apps like ATAC and what it's connected to, to be able to have, you know, waypoints or geographic boundaries or whatever you need to mark and have those communications and, uh, and successfully have that operational period or need uh, for communications is very beneficial. So you mentioned to go ten of there. Let's talk about that a little bit. You know, you guys have partnered with and, and started distributing some of GoTenna's solutions. Can you tell us a little bit about what about their solution specifically made you interested in partnering with them? And talk a little bit about how their solutions specifically have fit into the coronavirus response effort. Yeah, I can uh, kind of speak on the why we decided and why we kind of reached out to GoTenna and wanted to implement this and help bring this to the fire service is we, we follow kind of a paramilitaristic operations. Um, one of the thing in communications is the PACE acronym. Uh, this is just a, another tool in the toolbox and communications is the underlying, you know, cause for inefficiencies and in operations we saw you know, interoperability issues when we had the big fires out here in 03 and 07 and, and nationally when big incidents happen, interoperability and communication issues where, you know, one agency can't speak to another. Um, having these, you know, antennas that you can just go deploy uh, on a hilltop at a low cost and be able to communicate miles and miles through a secure network is a huge advantage and tool in the toolbox that can help operations uh, on different scales and different necessities and needs. As far as relating to COVID, uh, if you have, you know, an offsite hospital or something of that nature where personnel need to speak to each other or communicate with each other and they don't have that infrastructure built in with antennas or trunking or 800 system, I think it's a great use case scenario and advantage to do that. I know uh, we're obviously close to the border. So a lot of times we'll get bleed over on VHF from, from Mexico and they'll come into channels um, having again, this secure network where that can't happen uh, and you can communicate freely uh, is a huge advantage. I uh, second that what Brad said about the, the go products, but um, one of the things that I, that I thought was cool was the accountability factor and being able to see um, on video uh, where GPS locates your, your team. So if, if every person on your team has one of these things or say a strike team or, or each unit has it, a, a, the strike team leader or the incident commander, whoever it is, um, they can use this as an accountability tool. So you can literally see, uh, where they are, and then you can communicate with them via text. I thought that was one of the the um, best features about it because accountability and and um, especially on a wildland fire is um, crucial to the safety of your crews. Yeah, and, and to speak on the wildland fires, accountability. You know, when I go out as a public information officer, one of my jobs is to report statistics and numbers. And I remember on the Thomas fire and some of the bigger fires, campfire. You know, we can have up to forty five hundred firefighters assigned to a fire, uh, probably a quarter of those are actually during an operational period, whether it be a 12 hour operational period or 24 hour operational period. But can you imagine every single firefighter being issued one of these that's on operational period and having a massive uh, scale network of um, mesh communications, being able to go across miles and miles and miles that each one's connecting to each other. I mean, the opportunities for this to be implemented in that kind of scenario is pretty exciting to us. Uh, it does certainly seem like there's some really good use cases, especially in the wild and fire uh, situations. So obviously with the coronavirus pandemic going on, emergency responders, first responders are, are strapped already, they're spread thin. In that environment, what happens if a secondary disaster, something like a flood or a hurricane, we are entering hurricane wildfire season, you know, what if something like that were to happen? How could that further impact communications? 
Well, definitely. So I can uh, speak to California and how we operate. Um, we operate on what's called the master mutual aid where pretty much every fire department is assigned to this master mutual aid. Um, you have different types of incident management teams. You have a type three team, which is more of a local. So if we have an incident in San Diego County that this small team of local uh, personnel that are disciplined in different areas of whether it be logistics, communications, planning, uh, can facilitate that that incident. Now, on a bigger scale, type two, which you don't see very often, but type one team to where you've seen the big disasters of, you know, let's take the Montecito, Santa Barbara mudslides. The type one team is activated to mitigate that um, that incident. Uh, uh, and communication is, is huge. They bring in these these rescue teams, use our teams. So locally, uh, we will have an 800 system that we run pretty much our daily operations. But if you're a municipality or a fire department and you send a unit and resources, you switch over to a VHF, which is pretty much standardized throughout California. Go to the incident, get your radio program to the frequencies being used for your tactical and operational channel. Now, with these incidents, sometimes the antennas and communication infrastructures taking out uh, is taken out. So sometimes the communications team has to go set up remote satellites. Um, and just having a USAR team being able to travel with their own communications, uh, Keith alluded to as far as accountability and being able to go into a direct operational period with communications uh, is huge. So Gotenna, with that, again, with that PACE acronym, um, having all tools in the toolbox and communications is huge. Communications is probably our number one issue and uh, one of our biggest safety issues is having good communications and being able to program these directly on site and having accountability uh, helps facilitate those big incidents, knowing where you're at, where your personnel is at. Um, again, being able to go through your search and rescue, put your waypoints, combine that with uh, some of the mobile apps that are out there. Um, it's, it would be really beneficial and helpful. And kind of what we're trying to trying to get out there is having this little antenna in your toolbox as a means of communication, whether you need it as a secondary tertiary emergency device, or you are just using it for your daily operations. There's multiple use cases for it and how it can be implemented. You've been listening to the Last Mile podcast where we've been speaking with Brad Byan and Keith Cowell of Source One MRO, two gentlemen toiling on the front lines of the coronavirus pandemic. Brad and Keith, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me and our listeners today. Thank you. Appreciate having us and have a good rest of the day. Stay safe out there. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for uh, hosting this. It was my pleasure. I'd also like to thank you, our listeners. If you like what you heard here today, I'd encourage you to check out the Last Mile Online publication at connectthelastmile.com for even more content like this.